Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents Real Science Now, featuring top experts in science and medicine, covering everything from new planets to curing cancer to virtual reality and many topics in between. The Real Science Now lectures are hosted by the Great Lakes Science Center and presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University, its College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Thank you for joining us. My name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins. Today's program features three presentations entitled Evolution, the Origins of New Species, Chimpanzee Cognition, Why Chimps Do Math, and The Brain, What Happens to Humans Who Live and Work at Ultra High Altitude. Let's begin with Dr. Patricia Princehouse talking about how species evolve. I want to talk a little bit about species today. Uh, New species are found all the time. People don't often realize this. Uh, we are finding many, many new species every year. Uh, by some estimates, there are 100,000 species yet undiscovered, and uh, most of them will go extinct before we ever find them. Uh, another source, of course, uh, is uh, fossils. Uh, only about 1% of the uh, species that have ever lived uh, are currently alive. So we find a lot of, of fossils. And here are two that were found last year. Uh, one is a, uh, an ape from Europe, uh, found in the hills in uh, Catalonia. Uh, and uh, the other one is a, uh, a member of our own genus, uh, which has some interesting characteristics that I think one of our other speakers might talk about. Um, this is a ruby sea dragon, which was discovered in Australia. This was discovered by a graduate student who was running uh, genetic tests on other seahorses and came across a scrap of material that was different. He says, there's got to be a new species here. And he looked in museum collections and he found other individuals of that. No one has yet seen one alive. This is a reconstruction from the parts that they have. So there's a lot of different ways that you can find new species. This is a Galapagos tortoise. And a new species of Galapagos tortoise, believe it or not, was found last year. Uh, they had thought it was a continuous population across Santa Cruz Island. But in fact, there are two distinct populations, and they are genetically uh, quite, quite different. So now there are two Galapagos tortoise species. And it means that we need to safeguard both of them uh, so the populations are smaller than we thought, which is a problem. This is another interesting thing, this, um, the Gabon uh, flowering tree was found in Gabon by botanists. They were going back and forth doing their field work, and one of them sort of bumped into this tree that was right by the road. And he says, I don't know what this is. <laughs> and he looked at it, and it was a new species that they'd never seen before right there. That's how many species there are out there that are yet unknown. The other one here, the magnificent sundew, which is the largest of the sundews, uh, was a picture on Facebook. And somebody sent it to a botanist friend of theirs and said, what, what is this plant? And he looked at it, he's like, it's a sundew, that's what I work on. They ended up making a trip down to South America, finding this plant, and it is a new, a new species, unknown. Um, when you get into uh, uh, arthropods, there are many, many. Some of our students have worked in uh, Africa and South America uh, and have discovered new living species, especially of mantids, working with Gavin Swenson at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. So that's very fun. Um, our origins majors have a lot of things to draw from at Case. Um, Sixty different species, new species of, of damselflies and dragonflies were found last year. Uh, and this is called a tiny beetle. beetle. It was found by a concerted effort to uh, take a patch of rainforest and try to figure out what all the species are there to go about very uh, systematically. So again, another different way to look for them. It is, that is the head of a pin. Uh, that's how tiny it is, and they decided to call it the tiny be beetle. This, was, this one was not found last year, but it was found in 2005, recently, and this is a yeti crab. And uh, it is very unusual, and so you can see there are novelties still to be found. The reason it's so furry is it grows bacteria on, those, on that fur. And so these live in deep sea vents, and they collect bacteria, and they feed off the bacteria, a very unique lifestyle. Uh, last year, there was, in fact, another one found. In the meantime, there was a, th a third one found, Pura Vida. This is Kiwa tyleri, uh, and it, uh, also has the fuzz on the arms, but not as much. Uh, it's found off the coast of Antarctica. Uh, the first one is found near Costa Rica, and the other one in the Northern Sea. These are all related. They, they form a clade. The um, 
other crabs that they're related to are very speciose. They have a lot of different species, and so you can see how they might end up uh, being dispersed that far. Um, two other species to talk about. Uh, these are not new species, uh, but the blind cave fish is the, sort of the complement to the yeti crab because uh, they are not related. You'll find blind cave fish all over the world. They are not related to each other. They are related to the fish in the pond or river surrounding the cave. And so you have a lot of what's called convergent evolution. And it's very interesting because you get this loss of eyes, which Darwin remarked on and was very fascinated by. And uh, people had a lot of different explanations for that. It was uh, because they weren't being used as much or because it was energetically advantageous to let that part deteriorate. But recently, uh, we've found that uh, a lot of these uh, blind cave fish are co-opting part of their visual brain, the brain that had been put toward visual, and using it for olfaction. And they're finding their way by scent in the caves, again, in parallel. The uh, other one, the nylon-eating bacteria. You know that this is a new species to arise because nylon didn't exist more than, you know, in, uh, more than less than 100 years ago, right? And this is a real evolutionary novelty, and this is the uh, 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 chemical that it has evolved to, uh, uh, to use to digest the nylon. Um, so anyway, my question, what are species anyway? And uh, one way to look at it is that species are an illusion of stability in a world of flux, right? Species are constantly evolving for the past four billion years, right? Uh, and so at any moment in time, you're gonna have species, but those are gonna change. But there might be more to it. Species might have some reality to them that's rather than just, just uh, uh, a moment in time. Uh, and one attempt to explain what that might be is often called the biological species concept, uh, coined by Ernst Meyer. And uh, what they say this is, is groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such groups. So the idea is that the unit of selection is, is always a, a population, right? You have never an individual that evolves. You have a population. And that you have groups of populations that are interfertile. And that's the concept that most people are familiar with. But there are other concepts as well. Uh, a spin-off of this, uh, developed by a South African um, biologist, is the rate mate recognition concept. He says it doesn't really matter if they are genetically uh, isolated, if they can, can make hybrids, uh, if they don't in actuality recognize each other as mates, that's a good species. Uh, it's an interesting concept that was discovered in the, in the uh, 30s and 40s are a ring species. So you can have either along a coastline or around a mountain or around the, the, the uh, polar regions uh, individual uh, populations that can breed with the one next to them all the way down the coastline. But when you get to the end of the coastline, they can't breed with the first ones, with the farthest north ones, or the ones in, in one area can go around. So you have these species circles. And this is similar to, I keep going the wrong way. Um, actually, what's called a chronospecies. So if you think of the ring species, but in time rather than in space, uh, you have a transition from one species to another one very gradually. Uh, morphospecies are another way to, uh, to think about species, especially in the fossil record where we can't try to interbreed them. Right? This is a mate recognition example that people are familiar with. The coyote and the wolf can interbreed. They just don't recognize each other as mates. And as we know, coyotes tend to be uh, 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 individuals, and uh, uh, wolves go in packs. So with all of this, is there something new under the sun? And this is the issue of macroevolution. It's uh, uh, the formation of new species uh, and higher taxa, so families uh, on up. Um, but there's more to it than that. Uh, it is also the origin of evolutionary novelties um, and patterns of evolution and extinction. One of the, one of the uh, ways to start is to think about at the level of within species. These are horses uh, drawn, by, drawn and carved by uh, uh, our ancestors <laughs> uh, 12 to 17,000 years ago. And they look very much like these uh, Chualski horses that are still living, although in very small populations, uh, even down to the stripes that they sometimes have on their shoulders. Um, amazing detail. They're not 
quite like horses we have today. It doesn't look like a thoroughbred, right? This picture is from a little bit before that. It's 17,000 uh, years old in Peshmerl Cave. And when these were first discovered, the spots were thought to be ritualistic, have some kind of r religious significance, right? But in fact, uh, there is now DNA from horses living at that time, and they had spots. There were horses living at that time that were not the buckskin color of the Chualski horses, but actually had that variation. Uh, and of course, we still see this today. And this, this horse here, this young Appaloosa, has the same as that Peshmerl horse with the dark front and the spots on the, on the back and rear. Uh, so you see this mixture of very consistent traits and a lot of variation, and that's the raw material for evolution. Taking it a step beyond that to uh, uh, species that are uh, distinct, uh, you'll find what's called uh, an evolutionary pattern of adaptive radiation or, or evolutionary radiation. So these are the famous Galapagos finches. Uh, they're sort of much of a muchness, right? Uh, they're distinct species, but they do similar things. They have similar lifestyle, and they're not morphologically all that distinct. And so the question is, you have these, uh, uh, these genetic systems that somehow generate all of this diversity to create the biodiversity that we see around us, and yet we have a lot fewer genes than uh, we used to think we had. We used to think humans had 100,000 genes, now we're thinking maybe 30,000. Um, and the same thing with other species. So these are anemones. Um, you can see all this variation. We don't usually look at the faces of bats. They're very, very different. Bats are very speciose, one of the three uh, most species lineages. These are uh, bovids, antelopes, uh, hummingbirds, uh, frogs. Frogs tend to speciate very rapidly. A lot of the frogs are, are within the past few thousand years. Um, one way to think about these, uh, the way of generating uh, diversity is uh, a triangle developed by Adolf Zeilacher. He says there are constraints on evolution, and some of them are functional, so natural selection, right, uh, picks out what works. Some of them are fabricational, so they make their shells out of a particular thing. You make your bones out of a particular thing, and there's this uh, uh, dynamic between getting enough of that stuff to make your bones out of uh, and, and, and evolving to do something else or going extinct. And then there are phylogenetic constraints that uh, depend on the uh, developmental systems that are in the organisms that are the ancestors of, of the other one. Now, looking at this picture of these salamanders, you can see sort of a, a, a plan there, a little like the finches, except at a higher level. You see that some of them look more tadpole-like, some of them look much more, you know, they're entirely on the land, and you have all of this variation in between, right? Now, what we don't see is this lion goat boy. You see in the fossil record a lot of variation along developmental lines. You don't see really weird things popping out. Right? So what is it? What does macroevolution do? Here is an organism. As it grows up, it starts to get a little bit of a different uh, look to it, and then the adult has a very different look to it. Right? Those are chimpanzees, and you can see how similar the baby chimpanzee is to us in many ways and how different the adult is. Um, so if you're going to look for where did we come from, you might think we came from what's called a pedomorphic or, or juvenile looking. Uh, uh, version of an ancestor that had a little bit more of a face to it. And so there's a baby human. You can see it's different from the chimp, but more similar. There's an adult human. It doesn't change all that much. What would we look for in the fossil record to go from something that was more chimp-like to something that was more human-like? Perhaps something like this, uh, which looks like a juvenile chimpanzee, but is in fact a fully bipedal uh, human ancestor from about uh, three million years ago. We know it was walking upright because we have the footprints. But for every evolutionary novelty like this, the bipedality, there's perhaps 100 variations on a theme. It's a novelty because it really is rare. How do we build these things? Well, people sometimes think you have to have a different um, uh, build up from, uh, you know, to make a new thing. In fact, you don't have all these parts suddenly coming together into something. What you have are individual parts that do other things, that then get, get, get co-opted into a higher levels of, uh, of function and different function. And this is just at the gene level. You can see that genes contribute to lots of different traits uh, going up, so it's, it's very um, complicated. Uh, so Darwin had actually very sophisticated understanding of the fossil record, and he understood that migration plays an important role. A species starts out very locally, and then it spreads further. 
Uh, and so in the fossil record, what you should expect to see is uh, a species and then suddenly another species. It may be descended from that species, but it started in just one small place uh, and then took over to a larger area. He said, in fact, we have no just right to expect often to find intermediate varieties. Only a few species are undergoing change at any one period. And they then, they then branch out and, and you see complicated patterns in the fossil record. Now, Ernst Meyer, who gave us the biological species concept, uh, also gave us a theory of how species form. And he said, okay, if you think of a species on an island, you've got an island, if the water level goes up and you get two high places, you're gonna eventually get two islands, right? Then you've cut off the genetic continuity, and if it's cut off long enough, you'll get two different species. So you'll have speciation on each one. Um, this is sometimes called dumbbell allopatry. Um, Punctuate equilibria, uh, the, a, species, a, a theory of species formation, um, uh, relies on Meyer's next thought, which was, okay, what a lot of places aren't islands, right? What do you have? And I think of the Four Corners region in the southwest. If you think of the valleys there, maybe there are butterflies that fit in, you know, that's, that, that particular heat and temperature are, are suited for. Uh, what you're going to get is fragmentation of the population. And most of these are going to get absorbed or they're going to go extinct. Right? But now and then you'll get one that gets a toehold uh, and, and adapts by genetic drift, by natural selection, uh, and becomes a new species, and then just as Darwin says, uh, spreads out, sometimes into the home range of the parent species. Now, if that speciation happens at a very small scale like that, in a very local place, what kind of variation tends to arise? Developmental variation, and so like this uh, salamander's axolotl, this is what you're going to tend to see, and so this is why these patterns are what you're going to get. So thank you very much. You've been watching Patricia Princehouse talking about the emergence of new species. Up next is Dr. Sarah Boysen discussing how chimpanzees can be taught to do arithmetic. Now, back to the talk. I've come to share uh, research from the past that Given the topics we've heard this morning, probably none of you have ever read any of my work, but that's all right. I'm going to share some of that with you. A lovely introduction. It beats the introduction I had last year from a second grader, Dakota, who had written a research report uh, about my work, and I was working in another classroom and was invited in, and she started her talk this way. Dr. Sarah Boyson was born March 5th, 1949 and she's still alive today. <laughs> yes, I am. And I'm looking for another job, so keep that in mind. Um, it turns out that Dr. Dr. Princehouse is one of my former students. Nothing like feeling really old, you know, when you won awards, yada, yada, yada. But at any rate, she asked me to talk about some of our early work, which was about counting, trying to, to uh, take a nonverbal, non-human species and make that conceptual leap to understanding num the numerical process. Uh, and I also add to the title, why should we care? I am proud that we've made the National Enquirer three times during the course of my research career. Well, this is the family uh, uh, of the great apes. If nothing else, I want you to have a take home message of these are apes, okay? They're big. They have no tails. I could put you in a room with a monkey for an hour and with a chimpanzee for an hour and you wouldn't come out of one of those rooms. So there's a Difference between a monkey and an ape. These are apes. This is a great ape family, which I, some would argue, but I include humans as well. So my species of choice is the chimpanzee. Uh, bonobos are another rarer species of chimpanzee, only found in Zaire, Democratic Republic of Congo. And of course, this represents the lowland gorilla. We have um, also mountain gorillas and two species of, of orangs only found on the island of Borneo and also on Sumatra. So as I said, my species of choice is the chimpanzee. And what I'm really going to share with you is 
what I believe are the facts that we changed chimpanzee brains over the course of some 24 years of the work in our lab, and that the end product was a very different kind of individual than a laboratory chimp or a wild chimpanzee. So keep that in mind. We began a series of studies of numerical competence in chimpanzees, and I do have to admit that my question was, I wonder if. And I think that's a good way to start sometimes, <laughs> because I knew nothing about the numerical literature. I certainly knew about chimpanzees. I'd worked on a couple language projects before I came to Ohio State, where I wanted to pursue my own ideas. So I knew, I knew this. I knew that I was going to have to get across the idea of there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between an item you're counting and the label we have for it and the tagging of that, and that one-to-one -one correspondence was important. So with, with chimpanzees, what I learned over the years, I've, I've now worked with them for, oh, now I really date myself, 40 years, 40 years, uh, directly interacting with them. Uh, they taught me a lot. So I, I, and I gradually learned ways to get that information across to a brain that is not necessarily uh, as attentive. In fact, what we were really doing over the years was socializing attention, okay? I think our schools are full of children who never had that opportunity. And it's my belief also that if you miss that window of establishing those attentional pathways, that's it. I think there's definitely a, a critical kind of period, and we took advantage of that in the chimpanzee. So I got some ice cube trays and a bowl of wooden spoons, and the chimps had to learn to put one spool in one of the ice cube trays. That's how we started, very motoric, very uh, practiced, but in doing so, they also learned about turn taking, they learned about uh, there's this person here who's going to help me learn if I, you know, so there's a dialogue-like relationship that established. They had relationships among themselves as well. Daryl wanted all the turns, and he didn't want Kermit to have any. So you have to take the individual personalities into account as well. Next, if you look up at the top, this is an old image from one of our first publications. Um, I started with these round plastic lids. My husband at the time drank chock full of nuts coffee, and so I had a lot of yellow lids. And I put just a, I cut out a piece of electrical tape and put a dot there. Again, not knowing anything about the, the children's literature and counting, I know chimpanzees. I know they don't want to count a dot or a wooden spool, really but they sure want to count gumdrops, all right? And I think, as it turned out serendipitously, it was one of the pivotal things that, that were part of the design because what happened is the animals were hearing the word for each count, one or two or three. They were experiencing, you know, if you eat one gumdrop, but three is better, five is even, and when you get to eight, oh yeah. So there were all these er experiential factors involved as well. So once the chimps, now they also had to, I moved that dot around, well, they, they weren't getting it all. They would pick the blank lid. This made no sense to me. So I had to think about why, can, why aren't they tracking this? These are two yellow lids. So I, I went to Radio Shack, which at the time was you know, the place to get your stuff, and I found these little round magnets Okay, so I glued the magnet on that lid, and just that little bit of added dimensionality completely changed the task. Now, if you were a mother of an autistic child, would that ever occur to you? You would assume, I'm going to present things in the visual modality, and what, you're not paying attention, you're not getting it? Well, this made all the difference. As soon as I put those magnets in it, they started tracking them, moving them from different places. Once they were doing one at reliably, tracking the one magnet. Then I added two magnets, no more trials with one gumdrop, only trials with two, okay? Because, and every time they did, my ex asked me to say, I don't know how you go in there every day and do this over and over. Well, I am persistent. I would, ev I would after they picked the right magnet, I would take each gumdrop and I would put it on top of a magnet and say one, two, 
and then they got to eat them, <laughs> best part. So once they were tracking the two magnets, then I introduced both lids, okay? So the, well, both lids were there, but we didn't have any trials with two things. Now, once I introduced one gumdrop again on a trial, now they really had to make a discrimination, okay? Before, they could, oh, they made some mistakes. Oh, we're supposed to, it's two. I'm supposed to do this one. Now they had to decide. And it, it took a long time to make that transition, but, but the subsequent transitions were much, much easier. So ultimately, they were tracking, if I put one gumdrop, two, or three, they were tracking it on the number of magnets, okay? Now you can see there's also a, a configuration from those magnets. It may be that they had no idea that the one-to-one -one correspondence had anything to do with which one they were picking. We didn't know, right? Can't see what's going on in there. So I, I wanted to use Arabic numerals, so what I did is simply take away the lid with one magnet and replace it with um, mailbox numerals on a square of plastic. And they actually made the transition pretty easily. I was quite surprised. But then again, you know, they know it's not three. I think it was by exclusion. Not three things, it's not two things. Well, I guess I'll pick this novel thing right in the middle, which is a tendency for kids and, and monkeys and apes to choose novelty. So again, we did the same process of moving the stimuli around, and eventually they could track the number associated with an array of candy, and we added additional numbers. Um, I added four, then at that point I added zero, because I wanted to anchor the number line. And I'll, it's very interesting what they did with zero, particularly for one chimp, because I had just an empty tray, okay? No candy. Couldn't reward them because I didn't want to confuse them. So with Sheba, who would get, she was such a drama queen, she would get upset if she was wrong. You couldn't say no around her. She would have a hissy fit, roll, gag, you know, just fall apart. So I never could say no. So what I did instead is I just gave her a little kiss for zero. And I swear to you, it's on film, ultimately, when we were doing zero trials, <laughs> she would ultimately go like this, like, really, no kiss is necessary, no. <laughs> so you'll see in a little bit how we did determine what zero meant to them. Now, one thing I did learn from the ape language projects, uh, I worked on one with sign language and also one with graphic symbols that were interfaced to a computer. And we, at that lab, we learned that if a chimp can produce a label for something by doing a sign or, or touching a key that stands for, say, orange, okay? If I then had an orange, a banana, and an apple, and I used the keyboard and asked the chimp, essentially, which one's the orange? That is, I'm asking him to comprehend my use of the symbol, okay? Rather than him labeling it, which is comparable to productive language in humans and children, but we also have to understand language so that we can have that dialogue, right? You have to produce it and you have to understand it. So when I use the symbol, that's a, a cue for the chimp to demonstrate their understanding of comprehension, and they did not have a clue. So unlike children, which is really the opposite, in children, language comprehension comes first, and then productive language follows. The chimps with productive language, giving them a language system, did not automatically understand the use of the symbols by someone else. We had to teach that separately. So that was very telling to me, and I really wanted the, the numbers to be um, conceptually whole for the animal. So I knew I really had to try and teach them uh, re receptive language. And so initially, the, the, the animals will tell you what you're doing wrong. Initially, I put arrays of candy out, you know, like, like five over here and two over here, and then you put the number two up, and they're supposed to decode it and then pick the array that matches the number. There isn't a chimp or a child on the planet who given a choice between five gumdrops and two, I don't care what's on the screen, I want five. So very quickly, I went, okay, this is, oh no, this is not working. So I went back to the magnets, and don't you know, 
they're instantly doing the task. So now they could use the numbers themselves to label arrays, or they could understand the use of the number by someone else. And I think, again, that's very, very critical. Because think of the du uh, duplication of the concept in terms of where it's stored. You've got the image of a two, you've got the image of two things, you've got the sound of the word, um, you have the experience of eating two versus eating only one. So that whole concept is represented all throughout the brain, and I think it's really important for the emergence of new information. Now we did find out <laughs> that when we one day ran out of gumdrops and I added some M&Ms that the chimps had no clue what that meant. Okay, wait, you told me that I was supposed to count, you know, gumdrops and now, well, so there's two gumdrops. Well, there's two M&Ms there too, oh. So again, unlike children who who really learn it experientially with the counting games that we play for them, they eventually learn. It's one of the basic rules that emerge even in kids before they've had any formal training in arithmetic or counting, uh, that anything can be counted. And so we had to essentially teach the chimps that, that you can use the number system for anything. And, and, that, and of course they were fine. But I really wondered, how are these numbers functioning for them? So I designed two tasks and interestingly, uh, I thought these were tasks I could teach the chimps, okay? You've just heard about the only training experience they had in productive use of numbers and receptive use of numbers. So I thought, well, let's create some little hiding locations. I'll put an orange there. It's visually salient. My chimps, for oranges are like pff, lettuce. You know, I'll eat that if I have to, but, you know, I'd rather have an avocado or some vanilla yogurt. So oranges were a good thing to use. They, they wouldn't mess with them. So I, I would hide numbers of oranges in either behind that stump, which is not represented properly in this drawing, uh, or in the food bin, or in a plastic uh, dish pan. And I started just by laying out some numbers and taking one chimp, Sheba, around to the different locations. I go, oh, look, there's a there's an orange there. Oh, nothing over here. Oh, there's two oranges over here. Now again, I thought I could teach her this. We came back to the station where the numbers were, and she said, three. Okay, look, lucky guess. All right, we'll do another trial. We did two more trials, and she got them all right. And at that point, I put her back in her cage, much to her protesting, and drove to campus, got my husband and said, you have to come to the lab. We got to run a double blind test. She was 88%, okay? Ooh, I just got chills even, even now after all these years. Where did that come from? This is that emergent property I'm talking about when you have a concept that is so grounded in different modalities that you, and, and guess what? That's what children do. You see emergent skills, emergent understanding, and nobody teaches them. I'm sure there have been many, many parents who's, who come home and the kids show something and the father says, well, I didn't teach him that. And, she's, and mom says, I didn't teach him that. That's right. That brain was working and, and put those properties together in novel new ways of understanding. And it happens in chimpanzees. Well, I had about two weeks before the fir ever, first ever paper session I had organized for um, the Midwestern Psych Association meetings. And I had sent letters to all the famous people in the literature. And they all said they would come. OK. So I've got like two weeks. All right, what if? I put the numbers out there instead of items. Maybe I could teach the chimps this before the conference that I could have some really interesting you know, data that would be unexplainable except to acknowledge that the chimps know how to count and they know how to count in the manner similar to young children. Okay, so we did the same routine. I put numbers out there, yada, 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 including zero. And again, did a few trials, 100%, went to campus, got the husband, now ex-husband could be part of it, and said, we got to run double blind studies, right? We got to run a double blind test right now. And again, 
between 87 and 90 percent correct. What? First of all, who taught them to sum things, to sum oranges, to move in time and space and re remember the array size over time, move, and then come back and be able to intuit what I wanted her to do and answer the question. But now, oh my God, how am I going to explain this in my, at my session? These are chimps that are counting. You can't explain their behavior by, because I've had colleagues who have said, you know, I've been trying for five years to figure out how the chimps could do that. To take a symbol, hold that in memory, move in time and space and put those symbols together and provide the total number for me. It was remarkable. Um, including trials where zero, say zero plus four. And what do you think they answered? Four. Oh my God. They understood that zero was nothingness. Okay? And if you add nothing to something, you have that same something. I did not teach them that. Okay? I did the kissing. I It was just mind boggling that these capabilities emerged as they did. Then I read the children's literature, <laughs> and I discovered all these kinds of amazing capabilities that kids have before age three, including the invention of addition algorithms. That's exactly what the chimpanzees did as well. Invented, created addition algorithms that worked for them. Ooh, I'm really behind here. Um, let me just get through this real quick. Again, this is a way to look at um, how the numbers function for the chimps. I really wanted to look at deception, um, and it turned out, because I'll tell you right up front, they couldn't learn this task, and because they couldn't learn the task, I've said forget trying to study deception and, and, and social, uh, in a social kind of setting. Uh, I think it was B.F. Skinner who maybe said, even though I still badmouth his research, even though I had a lovely visit with him for three days at Harvard one time. Um, he said, if you find something interesting, stop everything else and study that. So I want to figure out why can't these enculturated chimpanzees who have all these other skills learn this task. I've got two bowls, okay? Here's the task. I got, let's say I got seven candies here and I got three over here. Here are the rules. Whichever dish you pick, I'm giving to your partner. And you get the remaining, okay? So <laughs> if you're smart, you're going to pick the dish with fewer items, and you get the larger remainder. They could not do this task. And in fact, we did variations of it in, in some respects for five years, and still nothing, okay? I couldn't understand. I started with Sarah. She, was, is, she has a better Vita than I do, as a, you know? She could not get this, and she knew within a millisecond of presenting a trial because she would hit the apparatus, and we had, we had to be careful not to, you know, we were holding on because she was going to be ticked. Give her another trial. She did exactly the same thing. All right, this, again, how, what is happening here? Why can't they learn what would be a simple, you know, reverse contingency, okay? Very quickly. There's Sheba press, picking the number two, and Bobby's just sitting there because he knows he's going to get candy. All right. So here's what happened. Whoops, let me go back. I decided to introduce the numerals again. Okay. Now, you don't have to know anything about statistics to understand this graph. I've, I've shown this to second graders, Boy Scouts, uh, old, old people like this in wheelchairs. It doesn't matter. Just remember, tall bars good, short bars bad, all right? So what we did is an ABBA design of presenting two numbers to them. Oh, I can do this. Oh, two versus five. Oh, here, I pick two. Then I get five, remainder. It was a complete release from this very powerful predisposition to choose the larger amount, which they just could not inhibit. So you can see they went from success, candy, or numerals, candy, candy, numerals, numerals, candy, candy, numerals. Can't get a, a more, I, I couldn't make that up. Um, what I think is very significant about this, 
finding is, and this harkens back to some of the other speakers, really, there are two things that look at how powerful a symbolic representation is, that it, that it can release you from these biologically endowed uh, phenomena, likely a variety of them, and allow you to in, invest all that in a symbolic representation. It was just so elegant, I couldn't believe I actually designed the experiment. Uh, and what's even more pleasing is that since that time, many, many people have gone on to uh, use the design, uh, and I, I think they should start calling it the Boyson effect, because I'd really like to have that in the literature. But uh, I am told that I have two ex-husbands who say there's, there really is a Boyson effect already. Um, but again, very powerful demonstration of this kind of, of phenomena. To all of you that are out there, it is your individual responsibility as a scientist to do outreach. Even into elementary school, middle school, high school is almost too late. Make your work accessible. Show your excitement, show your passion for what you do, because that's why you do it. And cultivate relationships with the public and with the press. And that's going to make a difference. Thanks. You've been watching Dr. Sarah Boysen talking about how she taught chimpanzees to do simple arithmetic. Up next is Dr. Michael Decker discussing what happens to our brain when it is deprived of oxygen. Now, back to the talk. Today I'm going to talk about life at 70,000 feet and above and how we got there. So beginning back when I was a student here at Case in the, the 80s and the 90s, my program of research really started to focus on defining how does environmentally induced low oxygen impact the brain? High altitude, living in the Andes, how, how does that affect us? And how does that dysfunction of, of that brain impairment show itself? What are the symptoms? Can we develop techniques to prevent that dysfunction? And in brains that have been damaged, how do we restore that function? So, and I wanted to highlight this because as, a, as an undergraduate student at Case, I had the opportunity to work with Cynthia Bell, Dr. Lamano, who will be speaking later. And this is some of the work that we did in Tibet, Bolivia. There's me in a tent in Ethiopia. And to understand the effects of, of low oxygen upon human physiology, we had to travel to these places and spend time there. We studied over 1,000 people. We looked at everything from their genetics, their DNA, all the way up to how they breathe. And what was interesting is, is I got very sick on those trips. And in fact, Dr. Bell started bringing my wife along because they got tired of taking care of me. And they brought Debbie along so that she could get me home. But after our trips, we received this letter from Sir Edmund Hillary's physician. And this physician sent us this letter because we, we left some equipment in Tibet that was donated to the base camp uh, at the bottom of Everest. And our equipment was used to evacuate Sir Edmund Hillary off the side of Everest. And at one point, uh, this is a person who climbed Everest many times without oxygen. And one day, he developed high altitude pulmonary edema, which is one of the, the problems I experienced. And that letter and, and our lessons taught us that past performance doesn't always predict what, how we're going to respond in the future to any given event. So that really started us thinking about how do we prepare people for the future of some of the high altitude work we're going to be doing. Uh, one of the ways we did that is uh, some of my earlier studies, we actually developed models in which we could expose these models to low amounts of oxygen and then study the effects on physiology, the brain, and then develop interventions. Uh, one way to do that is to just put little mice and rats in a little box and give them low oxygen, much like we experience when we go up to high altitude. And just quickly, this is, is some of the findings that we had. What you see on the top left is a bar showing blue and purple. The blue are little rats and mice that were made hypoxic or given low levels of oxygen. The pink are their litter mates that weren't. And this is exactly what happens to humans at birth sometimes that are born prematurely. And what you'll see is that the arrows are pointing to those little mice and rats that were exposed to low oxygen. They grow up to be sleepy adults. They can't stay awake. They spend more time asleep. They spend less time awake. When they are awake, they tend to be hyperactive. This graph over on the right with the arrows shows levels of activity. And those red arrows next to the dots show that these animals, as they grow up to become adults, 
are twice as active as those who weren't exposed to low oxygen. And on the bottom graph on the left, we see arrows. This is learning and memory that occurs over a 10-day period. And what we see is that on each day of a test, uh, the animals exposed to low oxygen at birth are now adults. They're on the top. The other ones are on the bottom. And those red arrows are pointing to the number of mistakes that were made during each day of the test. So what we learned was that exposing the brain to low oxygen, especially around a period of critical brain development, leads to changes that persist throughout the lifetime. And that we have adults who grow up to be a little bit less alert. They always talk about being a, in a brain fog or a little fuzzy. They're a little hyperactive when they are awake and they have terrible problems with learning and memory, often wondering where they've left their car keys. One of the problems or one of the challenges that I was given uh, when I was in the Department of Neurology is my, my chairman said, you've now characterized what happens, figure out why. What is happening to the brain? And this is some of the work that Dr. Lamana led me through when I was a student, and he'll talk about this a little later. But what you're seeing here is a section of the brain called a hippocampus. And on the left is a normal hippocampus, and on the right is the a hippocampus of a brain exposed to low oxygen. Now the hippocampus is that part of our brain that we equate to a hard drive. It's where our long-term memories are stored. It's where, it's where we remember everything. Short-term memories are some, somewhere else, and we'll talk about that next. But on the left, you see these little black dots. Those little black dots are cells that are dying, and every normal brain has cells that die every day. On the right is a brain that was exposed to low oxygen, and you can see the huge number of black dots representing a large number of cells that are dying. So what this tells us is just low oxygen, such as going up to high altitude, induces a pattern of cell death in the part of the brain that controls long-term memory um, and, and who and what we are. Now, I think about that when we go hiking in Colorado, when we go to some of the high altitude villages. And in fact, we work with the group who climbed Everest in 62. And they reported that after climbing Everest, it took about a year for a lot of their psychomotor control to come back. These people had trouble writing their names. They had trouble just doing simple mathematical equations. And these were scientists and clinicians who were, who were very adept at those. So this is something that we're all lucky enough to experience. So, so there's a, it hits all of us equally. Another part of the brain that we looked at that we wanted to understand if it was really vulnerable to this low oxygen is the area of the brain that makes dopamine. Now, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's involved with substance abuse. It's involved with working memory. It's involved with motivation. Parkinson's disease is an example where people lose their dopamine levels, and they begin to lose that motor control. And what you see on the left is our dopamine neurons, those big, round, puffy things, are from a nice, healthy brain. And there's a few little black spots showing that some of those are, are passing away as they should. And on the right is a brain that was exposed again to low oxygen. And we see those dopamine neurons are a little crispy. They kind of look like bacon. They're a little shriveled up. There's a lot more that are dying. So we've also learned that low oxygen affects dopamine. So now we see two different brain regions that are involved with learning, memory, locomotor activity. Many of our daily functions are exquisitely vulnerable to even just one short exposure to low oxygen. There we go. Well, how do we back up? Let's see. Sorry about that. This is an electron microscopy picture. This is a section of two different brains again, normal on the right, low oxygen on the, or sorry, on the left, a low oxygen brain on the right. And this is a dopamine neuron with electron microscopy. And what you're seeing are those little black spots represent the neurotransmitters. And on the, the right, you see that the neurotransmitters, those little black spots, there are far more of them. They're this means that there's more dopamine stuck inside the neuron. So the neurons are broken. So those neurons that do survive low oxygen and don't die, they're permanently damaged. They've lost their function. There's something not quite right with those neurons. So we tried to understand, what does that mean to us? And, and this will, when we get to life at 70,000 feet, we'll begin to see the implications. Uh, what we're seeing is that these broken dopamine neurons actually may predispose the brain later in life to an increased vulnerability to liking substances of abuse, such as amphetamines. What we're seeing on the left is a graph. This, these are uh, little rats that were given D-amphetamine. The blue represents healthy, normal rats. And you'll see that at about 
6.30 or 18.30, we gave an injection of, of amphetamine, and there was a 300% increase in, in brain dopamine levels. And this is what happens to the healthy normal brain. The red are little rats that were made hypoxic as newborns, and they're now adults, and they received that same injection of amphetamine. They had an 800% release of uh, dopamine. And what that tells us is if the brain has this huge release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter involved with wanting and liking and a lot of hedonistic things, then it may actually increase the propensity to want to try that experience again. And we can see from that red bar that indeed dopamine is released by amphetamines and it stays around for a long time. And on the right is just a, another experiment showing that if we take those same rats and expose them to dopamine, do they like it? And what we see is that on that far bar on the right with the black represents how much time a rat that received dopamine in one box will sit in another and wait for it. So if we train a rat that is going to get dopamine in this box, or sorry, amphetamine, it will run to that box and it'll sit there and it won't leave again until it gets that injection. So they really like that drug. Now the human brain works very much the same way. So this is a model of what's happening inside the human brain that, that we've been able to replicate. And some of our works actually helped, uh, the legal systems picked up on this and helped think about, in this case, pr premature infants when they're exposed to low oxygen, how this leads to alterations later in life and may predispose them to be drug seekers. So rather than thinking of substance abuse as uh, a purely psychological or psychosocial effect, we also think of what's the brain mechanisms that may work with the environmental, environmental mechanisms to promote wanting of drugs later in life. Our work also uh, was followed up by others who found that children who are exposed to low oxygen shortly around the birth period grow up to be academically poor performers. And if we do an intervention to prevent those low oxygen events from happening, such as a tonsillectomy, their grades actually improve. So a lot of the work that we did at the basic science level and the clinical level has now been translated to other populations and replicated and validated. Now that history of looking at the effects of low oxygen on the brain and how they impact the brain and how they change behavior was, was kind of picked up by the 7th, 11th wing of the, uh, the United States Air Force down at Wright-Patterson. And they've contacted us because they have several areas of high priority research focused in this theme that they'd like us to help them think about and work with. So I have a couple of videos here that I think would be helpful to look at if I can get them to run. But one of the issues that's popped up is the stealth fighter. And this is all off of YouTube, so I can talk about it. And it's been published. But uh, there's been a history of the self stealth fighter pilots having problems, uh, experiencing symptoms that are similar to those experienced at very high altitude. So people report that they have um, dizziness, they become confused, and we're unsure quite what's happening up there, and how do we replicate that? And, and if I can get this video to work, maybe Patricia can help me. It's this one up on the right. It actually shows a pilot passing out. There we go. And, and there's audio with this. Fortunately, he's not flying. He's out. Yeah, about seven and a half or so. That's pretty good. Now this is from YouTube, so you can all pull this down and look at this. That's about seven and a half, I think. On that ball. See those guys down there riding four wheelers? Sure. We got fast out there for a second. Did you? Yeah. I think maybe you think you maybe just had the vision go away. I don't know if you were actually asleep or not. All right, so that's an example of, of what's happening with some of the pilots. And it doesn't happen to all, and it doesn't happen every time. But this is one of the questions we've been asked to explore, is why is this happening in some and not others, and how can we prevent that? Uh, I'd like to show you one other video. It's about a minute. It's, it's the fellow here below that. And this is in a test chamber, some of the equipment we use at Wright-Patterson. And on the top left are G-forces, so he's now spinning.
He's out. He'll come right back, though. That's G loss, loss of consciousness due to G forces. Water cures everything. So, and he was in that device at the bottom, which is the, the centrifuge, uh, spinning around at G forces. So, so this is one of the questions: is why are some people predisposed to this, others are not? How can we predict it? How can we prevent it? And how do we intervene with it? This is project one that we'll be starting within the next couple of months here at Case Western. Uh, let's move on to the next. The next project is, is equally interesting. I'm going to start by this video on the right. This is a U-2 pilot. And these are pilots who fly at 70,000 feet. And we'll see if we can get that video to run, just to give you an idea of what it looks like from their cockpit. So this is one of the U-2 spy planes. And again, this is on YouTube, so I'm not showing anything that uh, isn't publicly available. And this video only runs a minute, but it gives you an idea of the altitude that these planes fly. Anybody who's seen a Bridge of Spies, the story is about this plane. You'll notice the pilot's in a spacesuit. Uh, the barometric pressure is very low. If you look behind, you're beginning to see the curve of the Earth. Here we are at 70,000 feet. So again, at the very verge of space. And we'll hear more about some of this high altitude work uh, later from our colleagues. Uh, the video just goes on for another moment. It's just got some great pictures. So again, as we think about living and working at these high altitudes, how does this impact us? What are the occupational hazards associated with this? And this, that picture of the Earth was from inside that plane. And we'll stop there. Thank you very much. The Real Science Now lectures are hosted by the Great Lakes Science Center and presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University, its College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. For more information on Real Science Now and the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.